and they are the 2A champions, winning 34, 32. Coach David Hagen in his first year winning a state title. If you were to talk Pelican Rapids and talk Pelican Rapids sports, the first two things that are going to come to mind is Rex Haugen and Pelican Rapids basketball. Pelican Rapids was always known for having a tough basketball team year in and year out, coached by Rex Haugen. And as us little kids growing up, coming up through the ranks, dribbling a basketball, we all wanted to play for Rex Haugen. And as you get older, you realize that not everybody's going to get to play basketball for Pelican Rapids. So Pelican Rapids, as far as when you thought about sports, all you could think about was barn burners at Concordia at tournament time, WDAY, Ed Schultz calling a game, and you knew a Rex Haugen basketball team was going to be there. One thing you didn't really think about was, would Pelican Rapids ever have a football team uh, contend for a state championship? Because let me tell you, there was many years that Pelican Rapids football was 0-8, 1-7, 2-6. Uh, growing up when we were elementary school, even into, uh, you know, junior high. And, you know, it goes back to Coach Olson coming in, starting to build a program and develop a program and, and develop a we-can-do-it attitude. And that transferred all the way up to our senior year to Coach Haugen, Coach Everett, Coach Marty, Coach Anderson, and a host of other coaches coming in saying, you know, we got some unfinished business. It's time to finish the business. But you would think for a number of years, Pelican Rapids was always known for basketball. You're not probably gonna think about Pelican Rapids football, but there was one year that they won state. The, how the last season ended our junior year was up in War Road, and it was 30 to nothing. We didn't even, we didn't score, we couldn't do anything. First time we played them during the regular season, we beat them, we could use our team speed. Second time we played them, we played them at their house in War Road. It was raining, it was cold. I remember the tornado sirens going off, and they took it to us. And I remember being in the locker room and Matt Terry turning around and saying, as far as I'm concerned, our senior football season starts right now. After, after tonight, we'll be in the weight room getting ready for our senior season. And that's where it, that's where it spawned off. He's like, we're gonna be state champs our senior year. I never wanted to lose like that again. And we had never lost like that, that I can remember a couple teams handled us pretty well that year, but nobody, blew us away like that and that that was different that was like uh, a real beat down like that was a shot at you and I didn't like that we we got beat up and I did not want to ever get beat up like that again I walked out the field miserable and then you get on a bus and you have to drive four hours home to get home at like 2 30 3 o'clock in the morning um, yeah it was miserable um, I hated every minute of it um, I couldn't wait to wake up and start to do something about it. I mean, I know I couldn't till the next year. I knew we would, would likely get to play him next year, no matter how the 2A, 3A split was going to go. It was going to be different. I knew that because um, that was, it was horrible. It was one of the... It was, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's embarrassing. We had a coaching change during the during the summer. Uh, Daryl Olson, who I had was the head coach, had been here five six years, and ended up taking a job at Maple Grove, Minnesota, as an assistant football coach and a teacher down there. Also one of our other assistants at the time, Joel Stangler, had been here a couple years and he left to become a math teacher down the, the city's area. 
And with that, there were two openings that we had to fill. Dave Haugen then become the head coach, and he had stepped down the year before from the coaching rank. He had been coaching previously for quite a few years since college, and then he stepped down, stepped back from it, and was coaching probably basketball for sure and some track. And then he wanted to get back in. And with him wanting to get back in, uh, Mr. Klein, then I visited a long time about it. And it would, uh, was a good fit for us because if he wanted back in, I knew I was gonna be involved with the coaching at the varsity level. Technically being the athletic director, and technically hiring myself to be a coach, we had to make sure that we were on the same page as to how it was gonna be handled during the year. And Dave, much to his credit, was very receptive how that was going to work out with me being the offensive coordinator. And, uh, you know, it worked out for the best for everything. As, you know, it could have gone haywire, but it didn't because we had good players who got along well. And uh, we just played uh, played the game. It wasn't, wasn't much problems with it as far as we were concerned. Uh, Mr. Marty handled the defense. Dave Hogan was kind of the overseer of all the special teams and of course would make the final decision as far as if we were gonna punt or not punt and things like that. But uh, it worked out the best. I didn't think of it as being a diff difficult transition. It was a fun process, a fun uh, situation. I remember him telling me uh, when we were in his athletic director office one time that whenever we were in that office, he was the boss. And when we were in the coach's office, I was the boss and I don't remember any conflict happening on, on either end of it or any situation that uh, would have been tenuous at all, but it was good to clarify that early on. Um, and then uh, Jeff Marty was coming back as a defensive coordinator, and uh, I'd been very impressed watching him coach and knowing what he could do, that there was really no really consideration of anything other than having, having Coach Marty running the defense again. So in that sense, we, we really just picked up uh, from where we had left off the year before. The summer before our senior year is when uh, we learned that um, Coach Olson was going to a different school. And uh, I remember being in a meeting with the team when this was announced. Um, I think we were in the gym and we learned, and it was kind of a shocker because even at that time, we didn't know exactly who the coaches were gonna be. When that announcement was made, we didn't have that awful much time to like m learn who the coaches were figure out what the plan is, what the offense is going to be, what the defense is going to be before we even started the season. So you go in with some high expectations and then all of a sudden you have a different coach, different coaches. Then what do you do, you know? Like, but interestingly, Coach Haugen came back, be the head coach. Thank our lucky stars, Coach Everett agreed to be the offensive coordinator. You know, we ended up with a really great coaching staff that was dedicated and knew a lot about our team already. And so we were in really good shape. And but we incorporated a lot of the things that D Darrell Olson had used and then brought uh, things that I had used previously that we wanted to do. Right after the coaching change in the summer, um, I remember being in the locker room probably after lifting weights one day, and uh, there was a little coach's office, and I walked by the coach's office in the locker room, and Haugen flagged me down and uh, told me to come over here. He goes, I got an idea. And uh, so he sat me down in that little coach's office, shut the door, and he pulled out this little flyer, and he had drawn a sketch of a, he goes, I think we should, I'm gonna order these t-shirts for you. What do you guys think? And and so I, I looked at it, and it. It said, it, had, it said unfinished business was the tagline on there. And he goes, he goes, I feel like you guys have lots of potential this year. I don't like what happened to you guys last year. And I feel like this t-shirt for this team makes sense that we to, you know, we have unfinished business. We, we're not happy with what happened before and we're gonna, we're gonna finish business this year. And that made me feel like he had just came on board he had just kind of dedicated his football, you know, future career to our team, and he's thinking about this. It just made me feel proud that he was our coach because he he believed in us. He cared cared about us as a team and about individuals, and he was trying to figure out creative ways to motivate us going into the 
into the future. So that tagline is something that I think we all probably remember and that we all believed in and, and, uh, and in a way kind of some, something that kind of carried us from week to week throughout the season. It's not that a, a t-shirt as simple as it sounds outline Heart of Lakes Conference, section championship, state championship on a t-shirt before you've even played one game as a step in them realizing the confidence and the belief that we had in them and wanting them to, to start carrying themselves that way. Us wearing those around the area and everybody seeing these unfinished business t-shirts, I've never seen any other team do that. Pretty awesome. Like obviously you're gonna talk about Dave. Uh, Dave Hoggle is a first year head head coach, was a great motivator, right? But he's also he worked he worked us hard, right? We had Marty who Marty was from the community, kinda yeah, second or third year, I think it was his second year. Uh, was a replacement for Dave Haugen. Marty was another guy that was, he was tough, but at the same time he was fair and he would kind of, they all kind of had that same mindset, right? Work, work, work. Um, a new guy that happened that they brought in was Kelly Funk. Kelly Funk for us was this young, fun, uh, offense and defensive line coach. He could quickly relate to us. We, he instantly built, built trust because I think he was close to our age, made it, made, it, made it easy for us to like relate back and forth. But then at the same time, it's a brand new coach and we want to work extra hard. You know, John Anderson, uh, bringing all of his uh, attention to detail and special teams, things like that. Uh, looking at, you know, his athletic uh, uh, training, um, having knowledge in that, being able to treat injuries and being able to look at things and, and figure out where uh, where a player was at and relay that information to Haugen and Everett or Jeff Marty um, so decisions could be made. Steve Schwantz helped us on the defensive line and did a great job of teaching us stunts. Coach Everett was uh, just a great guy and you know I, everybody remembers the poems and his little speeches but I, what I remember about him is how light he tried to keep everything. You know, in big moments, before big games, he's joking around in the locker room. Um, he's singing, he's dancing, he's just making it, taking all the pressure off of us. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a 16-year-old kid. The, the seniors on the team are 17 or 18-year-old kids, and it's a lot of pressure playing a state championship or a section title game. And he just made us relax, either with a poem or putting a song on the radio that he was singing to or dancing around to. Um, and just joking around and, and he felt like he was one of the guys. And uh, Coach Everett actually said something to me after my senior year that he may or may not remember, um, but it stuck with me and it pushed me through college was, he told me that I, in his 30 some years of coaching that I was one of the best non-athletic players he ever coached. Which at the time you're thinking, oh, thanks coach. You know, just what every athlete wants to hear that you're a, a really good non-athletic player. Um, but he, you know, and then he kind of explained it for a second and said, you know, you, you worked your tail off and I feel like you got the most out of what you were given. Um, and that, that stuck with me, you know, I got to college and I walk in there as a freshman and I'm looking going, man, I'm going to have to work my tail off if I want to play here. Um, and so that stuck with me and, and pushed me through college to, to work and continue to get better. And so that's something that, you know, one little thing that he said that he maybe doesn't even remember saying or, um, know why he said it or anything else, but he, he's maybe said it to a hundred other kids. I have no idea, but it stuck with me and it pushed me all the way through college. We had a particularly unselfish team, and I think that came from just playing a lot of sports together. You know, being in a small town, you know everybody in your grade, and so we'd see each other every day. And we played we played sports every day in the summer together. We played 
we played football at the football field when we were little uh, for countless hours. And then we had good coaches that I think, even when we were younger from seventh grade on up, that, that really, they were very positive in terms of, they I feel like they knew we had potential, but they never really let any of us get too high or higher than everybody else. I think the coaches did a really good job all the way through at kind of keeping our, knowing we had the potential, but keeping our uh, our confidence in check. I don't think there were too many egos on our team. I think we all had the same common goal. It didn't matter if Terry had 150 yards rushing and the other ones only had 25. At the end of the day, the object and the goal was to win the game. You know, some days, some nights, Terry would have an, a monster rushing day. Some games, it'd be Ryan Schuster would have a better day. Other days, it'd be, you know, Jake was the one. Um, but at the end, it was, we all had the one common goal. Nobody cared about stats or anything like that, I didn't think. It was all wins and losses. That's what it boiled down to us, I believe. Three words to describe Terry Motes. I would say the best ever. When your best player is that humble, and he is a humble guy, he is not me, me, me. He is, he's not rah, 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 he's a quiet guy. Terry Motes, one of the best athletes to come out of Pelican, definitely one of the best football players to ever come out of Pelican. I don't ever remember Terry Motes saying a negative thing towards another player. I remember going over to the elementary school to read, you know, go over and help the elementary school kids read books and stuff. You know, we'd go over there for like an hour at a time. And I remember one little like second grader asking me, do you know Terry Motes? I'm like, yeah, I know Terry Motes, you know, he's, and he's telling his little buddies, he knows Terry Motes. You know, it's, uh, he was a big star and, and um, it, it never, it never went to his head at all. He was always the same Terry Motes and just, Calm, cool, collective, nothing uh, nothing ever got to him. Great teammate. A guy like Jake Wies, it, that's a guy who, what makes a really good team is when you're, when the, the not the best player is really good, and Jake Wies is the greatest second best player any Pelican Rapids team has ever had. I mean, he is a true stud. When you talk about a stud, it's a guy who's just in the middle. He's a fullback, he's, he's a running back. I mean, he, he can throw the ball. He made huge plays. He intimidated the other team, I think. He was an intimidating guy. He's powerful and a uh, fun player to play with, especially if he's blocking for you. Uh, just a great football player. Jake Weiss was the kid that, that you need that hard nose. He was as hard as you could be. He expected a lot of us, but at the same time, really approachable, was a great friend. In the huddle, he always cracked a joke. That was him, he's dead serious. He's working super, super hard, super competitive, but at the same time, he always had fun. And in the biggest moments, one of the most reliable players that you can have. Three words that describe Ryan Schustrom. Uh, fast, smooth, physical. Uh, I think Pound for pound, he's one of my hardest hitters that I have ever coached over the years. There's a couple others that fit into his category, but he's he's right there. Ryan Schustrom was unbelievable athlete. He he could have played almost any position on the field and excelled at it. Um, and for him to not try and demand more carries or be upset that you know. Uh, Moats or Weiss are getting this attention or um, anything else. Uh, Ryan Schuster is the most underrated player on this on that team, in my opinion. Now, there's a lot of guys, like I said, that could have been uh, I could have mentioned for this, but you know, you look down at State, they they're kicking off and they look and go, well, don't kick it to Moats, let's just kick it to this number five over here, and he picks it up and runs it back for a touchdown. I mean, that's that's Ryan Schuster. Matt Sobert, as far as offensive goes and what we had asked of him to like run the options and pass whenever we needed it there was lots of times I didn't know who was getting the ball whether it was we up the middle or if he was pulling it and he would hang on to that ball till the last possible second knowing he's going to get hit by a defensive end just to make it so Terry had an easier route 
to the end zone. I mean, and then once teams started keying in on that, um, I thought Solberg did a really good job with like the fake pitches. So the defensive end would make him commit. He would do a fake pitch. The defensive end would go out there, and Solberg would take it up for a five, six yard gain. I mean, I, it was fun to watch him play. Matt Fear was an under the radar star. Uh, one of the guys that didn't get a lot of recognition um, until he did. Um, but but just kept going about his business and, and doing the job that he was called to do. So um, three words would be diligent, uh, faithful, dependable, which are three awfully good attributes to have as a, as a football player or at any stage of, of life that we go through as a, as a man. When I think about Billy Kreckelberg, I think about um, the word smart, and I think about him being sneaky athletic, but he was a great center, because he's super smart. He always blocked the right guy. And when I say sneaky athletic, I think when we were in seventh or eighth grade, the coaches tried to make him a running back even a little bit at some time, because because he could do it, man. And you see some of these clips, and I love look, watching through the old highlight tape. You see, and he's not the only one. Our offensive line was really good at this, but getting downfield, if they were playing, if they were playing a forefront and they left him open, I do not want to be that middle linebacker or any of those linebackers because he's getting on you every time. And it's just, it was just, he was just a great asset for, for our team. Um, I think about um, Matt Terry. I think about smart, um, dedicated, loyal, great teammate, great leader, and uh, a really good lineman. Like, not the biggest guy, but super strong because he lifted weights more than anybody else on our team. And super smart again. We had, our line was so smart. Like, they, they just knew where to block. You know, a lot of times, Quarterbacks are expected to know all the blocking assignments. To be real honest with you, I didn't always. Because our line was so smart, they knew exactly what to do. I didn't have to help anybody really out with that all that much, which was a great asset for me, so I could just focus on getting the ball to the studs so we could, uh, we could get some yards. Um, when I think of Eric Kubas, I think a just tough, just a, a football player, a perfect tackle for our offense, somebody willing to stick, do the dirty work and stick his nose in where, where he needed to. And especially on defense, man, like he had to go against some big guys. Being a D tackle in the middle, he just had to do the dirty work, stuff it up. Um, you know, one of the reasons maybe why we set a lot of the tackles he had was because guys like Eric Uvas and, and uh, Kirk Peterson on the inside and interior were keeping him clean so he could make all of those plays. Those guys were tough. Um, when I think about Trent Hagen, I think about an absolute beast. One thing about him that I was really proud of was that uh, he he didn't get it maybe a ton of accolades our junior year or or before that. You know, he was he was um, an all all state in track pretty much. You know, in uh, in throwing discus and great, great basketball player. And, you know, his trajectory, in my opinion, was, you know, gonna, he's get, by the end of his senior year, he's gonna be a stud basketball player no matter what. And maybe he didn't get a lot of accolades in football before that, but he came the senior year and he meant business. Knowing you're gonna play tight end in an offense where we throw the ball two to four times a game, <laughs> you're not gonna get the, a lot of passes thrown to you, but, uh, but you're willing to, you know, you know you're going to be in a blocking offense and be willing to do, do the dirty work as well. Chad Morrison. Um, so Chad Morrison didn't play when we were sophomores, just moved in from Montana. Played for one game when we were juniors and then quit. And then he came back, and when he came back, I mean, I knew he was fast from track. And I like I knew like he looked like he was strong. He looked like he was all of these things. But to just see him and to watch him, how fast he was, how like I mean he was incredible as a defensive player. Like almost like just burning around the end, right? Um, made a ton of plays. That's another guy that you can say 
if he was on any other team in the conference outside of probably two, which is probably us and DGF, he's the featured back on every single team, right? Guy ran a 4.640, was strong as heck. He just moved his feet. Like, there's all these kids that would have been stars in other places were just all on one team. Josh Hansen, just probably, that probably was one of my biggest impacts as a personal friend. And guys like Jason Dillon and Devin Pavlaki, who were weak side linebackers, those guys made big plays because everybody blocked Jake Weiss. You go to the defensive line, you look at Kirk Peterson, who went on to play football at Morehead State and was an All-American. I mean, Kirk was a football player. If you envision a football player, you think Kirk Peterson. Hard nose, strong, bulky. You can't, you can't, you can't get any better of a definition than a football player than than Kirk Peterson. You know, you go to wide receivers and you look at Nick Berg. Oh, the whole crew of Nick Berg is always the first guy there, <laughs> and then you know, everybody else. If Nick Berg came in the game, you knew you were going to score, and that's that's how it went all year. There's so many good players on our team. It's hard to mention them all. There's so many guys that were great football players that don't get the attention they deserve, and we get lumped together as, oh, what a great team. But you know, you got the Lucas Bakken, who's a great defensive back, uh, just steady back there. You know, and made so many plays. Operate in a good defense. You had the safety come over and hit the receiver, so it turned out almost as an interception. And Lucas Bakken had one tremendous tackle. Right uh, short of the goal line, or knocking the ball away. I mean, 25 years ago, I can just see it, but I can't remember if he knocked it away or if he tackled the guy for short of the end zone. That was huge. Gary Berg was a massive 250-pound offensive tackle. I remember when he stuck Stabler, who currently was the three-time state champ at heavyweight in wrestling. I kid about uh, Rocio Diaz, our, our kicker. Um, Again, you talk about a guy that's easy to overlook or just have as an afterthought because of all the skills and everything that was going on and yet such a critical role that he plays is we have a highly successful PAT conversion rate with him. He's kicking the extra point, extra point, extra point, which when you get into the close game like that really is the difference of the game. People don't realize, like, the long snapper, the holder is usually the punter, and the field goal kicker, in practice at the Division One level in the NFL, that's all those people do. Ben, Bakken, and Horatio barely practice that. I don't recall them really ever having any issues with the mechanics of that. And, and his kickoffs that allowed us to, to control field position as well and make an opponent drive the length of a field, which is really hard to do. So, you know, talk about a, a secret weapon. Uh, he definitely was, was one of them for us. For Dorn, I mean, I don't know how many teams <laughs> in, in our class level have someone like him as a pass rushing defensive tackle but in the state playoff games like he's like a little Tasmanian devil out there you know in Mitch like you know he's like the Rudy speech you know a hundred nothing five foot nothing you know the terrible knee but he's out there covering kicks you know never complained about that he'd be on the scout team you know giving us a look you know, he just wanted to be out there. I mean, you talk about like a love of football. So it's really cool, I think, when we talk about like this team and all these different people and personalities. And we all come into one year, which I think is really hard to do in a small town. That's the problem with a small town is you have great players and they're all spread out, but we had like the perfect storm of everybody is the same age and they're good football players. They like football, they're good guys. Uh, you know, almost everyone did well in the classroom and they were good off the field. We didn't have many problems there and it all just kind of came together perfect. Our practice schedule was such that we had a, some really good juniors that could have been playing varsity football. Our quarterback, Hovland, you know, would have been a great, he was a great backup for for Sober because Sober never got hurt. I mean, I just look at those sophomore juniors and we, we had good battles 
good battles against our varsity and, and one day, usually it was Wednesday. Wednesday was kind of a scrimmage day where we kind of went after it pretty hard and uh, you know would try to put in some new offense. You know, you know guys used to kid me if I saw it on Saturday on TV maybe they were going to see it on Monday at practice with some new wrinkle or something like that. My philosophy on conditioning I wanted as much as possible for practices to be harder than games. Dave Haugen was a, the assistant track coach. We ran Man at practice. We, uh, he implemented 350s, which is you run around the outside of the football field, is, and he wants you to do it by time based on your position. And there was one time in particular I remember being tired after a, after a practice and having to do conditioning. and. I thought I was running fast, but I must have been running slow because he came up and he was running alongside me. And then he spun around and started running backwards. I says, are you tired? Are you tired? Which made me mad. So of course I want to run faster than the guy, than the old guy, who's probably now my age. But of course I wanted to catch him because he was running backwards. I was running forward. 30 350s a week, 35 350s a week. I mean, the amount in which we ran, like we were like professional, like like we were like sprinters by the time the season was over. But I also remember, you know, running, having to run all those 350s in the fourth quarter when other teams were tired and their hands were on their hips. We were, we were ready to go. We we're just getting started. I, I remember that summer, I think I was with my brother-in-law, and somebody from another town goes, oh, how's Falcon football going to be this year? And I go, oh, well, you know, we should be all right. And my brother-in-law goes, they should be very good. Our first scrimmage was in Detroit Lakes, and at that scrimmage, we went in there with the idea that, okay, we think we're going to be pretty good. We had to scrimmage Detroit Lakes, and we had to scrimmage, I think Alexander is probably there, and then there were some smaller schools there. and. We just were really good. Uh, I can remember throwing touchdown bombs from Solberg to Moss on the end, just flying down the field, and and it was uh, kind of a rude awakening for Detroit Lakes and Alexandria to have Pelican Rapids come in there and really, for all practical purpose, uh, outplayed the teams we had played against that day. So then we knew our season probably was going to be pretty good. The polls came out, and I, for me. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, to be recognized on the list in the state of Minnesota, there's tons of football teams. So um, that pumped me up, you know, just to not think that was just a personal belief that within our team we thought we were good, that, you know, others thought that we could play some ball as well. I, I thought we probably should have been ahead of maybe a team or two on the list originally and kind of through the year, but that all proves itself out. season opener against DGF. We knew that they had a, a very good football team. We're well coached with an opener and a new coaching staff too. You just don't really know for sure where you're at with all the with all the pieces. Uh, I do know that we came off of a good scrimmage so that was helpful in building some confidence. I think we returned the opening kickoff for a touchdown in that game so certainly a, a good start. We also had some matchup problems just from a coaching standpoint because uh, the DGF head coach, Craig Anderson, had played for Chuck Everett in high school, so he knew him very well. But we did get the win in that game, so, so that was big. Uh, um, we went up, beat Roseau pretty soundly, although we didn't play our best game the week before. So we were 2-0, and it was parents' night, I believe, for Pelicans. So World's in Class 3A, and we're in Class 2A. I know for me personally, I knew like this was our chance, our one and only shot to uh, inflict whatever um, payback for the year before. I think we did. Um, we didn't score in the first quarter, but I think we really set a tone that um, it was gonna be our game. And I think in all phases of the game, we really 
dominated them and pushed them around. As much as they bullied us the year before and beat us, especially up front, that our offensive line and our, our tight ends dominated them up front. I mean, destroyed them. Our defensive line beat them physically. And it felt good. I mean, it felt really good um, to make them have a four hour ride back, knowing that, you know, we got our revenge. And yeah, felt, felt good, that's for sure. I started reading the papers, started believing everybody around town saying, you guys are gonna go undefeated, no one's gonna touch you. And for me, I thought, I mean, the first few games, nobody even came close to scoring on us. We were blowing people out. And then we get to Breck, opening kickoff. They return for a touchdown, which I was on the kickoff team and I took personal. The whole game was weird because we, a big part of our season was we would play American Pie before the game. And that is important, all right? That was one of the best parts of the year. And we did not at that game. And then there was a weird thing with Billy and an ambulance came and evidently then they ran the kickoff back. So yeah, I, that was a weird game. I guess though there is one good thing I can take away from that, from that Breckenridge game is that that loss told us that we were beatable. If we don't do the little things right, we can be beat. It can happen. And for me personally, as much as I hate to say it was a loss to Breck, I'm glad it happened during the season and not during a playoff game. And that Breck game, I think, refocused all of us. Like, we need to do all the little things correct in practice outside of practice to get ourselves mentally ready for the next for that week. I think that's what that loss taught us was that you can be beat, you have to do the right things. It had been kind of pointed out that it had been 10 years since we had won homecoming game and at the pep fest uh, that afternoon, I guaranteed a homecoming win. The, the purpose of our team, it was to really bring out the school spirit and to be the, the facilitators to bring together the community and, and school spirit. And so, yeah, we would hold, we would hold Pep Fest for, you know, homecoming week and being important when it got to the tournament, the games. And that was, you know, for our younger students in the district, along with our high school students, those would all entail, I mean, cause you had to make them fun. They wanted to be entertained. They wanted to share their school spirit. They wanted to, you, you wanted people to feel like they all belonged with and alongside the football team. It's homecoming against Manoman and as everybody knows, Manoman has a great history of football and we knew they were gonna come in, they were gonna be tough. We handled them pretty well and we got the win. So for one, that's a great, huge victory against the good football team. After a loss, we came back and we won a homecoming game, which we hadn't won a homecoming game in many years before that. I think it was 26 to 13 was that game. And so it was a little closer than people realize, but we still handled business against the good team. And so that was, that was a good thing. And, and not a lot of people might not remember, but that Monoman team the next year ended up winning state. So that makes me think about the, the season as a whole. Like we played some pretty darn good teams that year. Even though we f I feel like we steamrolled a lot of the teams, I, we, we played some pretty good teams. Breck was ranked, DGF was ranked. Purim ends up going to state in a class above us. We beat them. Um, OTC beats Breck. We come back and beat them by multiple touchdowns. Um, we beat Monoman at homecoming, and the next year Monoman ends up being state champions. You know, so like we played some really good teams that really kind of iron sharpens iron kind of idea that really got us prepared for the playoffs. And it said, 
Vikings are strong, there's no doubt about that. A group of young men, as tough as a pack. Weiss the bull, Moats the ram. Sustrom the tiger, sober the lamb. A line that is great and a defense that mauls. A team for each other that plays one for all. Heart of Lakes Conference title at stake. The boys are ready, make no mistake. Defense like thunder, hear the big crack. Offense like lightning, it's a fast track. As they get ready for another big night, the spirit is there and so is the fight. The season's been great for us and our friends, so let's go out and do it again. Perm was tough. They had, you know, they had a good offensive line, and they had Justin Stabler, and they had Eric Erickson, and they had Richter. They had a great team, and I remember we lined up on defense, and we never noticed, you know, how they were lining up or anything. And I remember their first play was a dive right up the middle, and me and me and Weiss make the tackle, and me and Weiss are both laying back, and that usually doesn't happen, uh, especially with Weiss in there. And we both get up, and I, I look at him, and I go, man, that Richter, he runs hard. And the next play we look, and here's Justin Stabler in the backfield. And Justin Stabler was uh, this stud from Perm who ended up wrestling heavyweight at Wisconsin and just a huge man, a great athlete. We were like, holy cow, this is going to be a long night. But we just continued to, to, to pound on them and uh, shut down the holes. To shut down a team like that, I thought, was a great feat. I mean, they went on, and if I remember right, I think they lost to Albany. Um, down at state, but they had an unbelievable team that year, and for us to shut them down defensively was huge. You know, and we only put up, I think the score was 14 nothing, if I remember right. So for us to put up only 14 points, that tells you how good a defense they had and how good a, how good a team they had as well. And, and being a class above us now at the state tournament, as far as they made it, um, shows that I, I think we could have played with just about anybody that year. And then uh, I feel like whether it was Breck or DGF, or Pelican Rapids, whoever's gonna come out of that section is gonna do pretty darn good in the state tournament because we've been beating each other up the whole time and getting better and better and better. Thank goodness the way the tiebreakers worked out. Breck had to beat up, or DGF and Breck had to beat each other up. Um, we got to play Benson and then we ended up playing DGF after that and the rest is history. One play that, that really sticks out to me in my head was uh, against DGF in the section title game when they went for the two-point conversion. Gutsy for them to not go for the tie, to go for the win. If we win, we're going to state. If we lose, we're done for the year. One of the most emotional, draining football games I've ever been associated with. I, I, I think the roller coaster that we were on that night was, was incredible. There's, there's probably about three times through the course of the game where I really thought it was over and that, okay, this is, this is how it's going to end. If you think of the chain of events that led into that play, um, number one, we were down 21-7. Uh, we got lucked out, scored a touchdown right before half. We're down 21-13. 20, um, we went back and forth for the third, for the third quarter. Um, at that point, Terry snuck around the corner, got a touchdown. I don't remember the score differential, but at the time we needed to go for two at that time. And so the defense called a timeout. Everett comes out there and he's standing in the huddle and he's just calm as can be. And he goes, goes, good job boys. Uh, and, and we're kind of expecting him to tell us what to do. And he goes, um, what, what play do you guys want to run? And we kind of looked at him like, like, okay, you're the coach, but we, we, it, 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 there was no hesitation with anybody. I think multiple players said, same play, same play. Uh, they can't stop it. So we, Moats just ran a 20 yard touchdown around the outside and we ran the exact same play. Pull, pitch, defensive end comes down, I get creamed, pitch it, pitch it off. To Moats, he runs around for a two point conversion and I think that sticks out in my mind the most because you, you have a, a legendary coach who has won multiple state championships, who comes into the huddle in such a pivotal game and he asks us what kind of play we should run. Because he kind of knew that we had momentum and we had a good feeling about what, what might happen. The following drive, Trent Hagen strips Ryan Welch, we recover it, 
Um, I think the next play, Jake Weiss breaks it up the gut for 40 yards, right? At that point, there's like three minutes left in the game, four minutes left in the game, right? Um, we're going back and forth. Terry Motes picks off a pass. The ball gets intercepted. It's inside the 10 yard line. Um, we get the ball back. First thing we do is false start. We follow up the false start with another false start, put ourselves inside the two yard line, run uh, something to Terry Motes on the left side, fumbles. DGF recovers it. At that point, um, my gosh. At that point, they give it to Ryan Welch on the left side. Ryan Welch scores a touchdown, okay? There's 51 seconds left. I'm guessing here. That's just my estimate, but 51 seconds left. Um, they come up to the line. I think there's a timeout. We weren't sure what their plan was. Go for one. I don't think that, I think they came out and said they're gonna go for two. We call, we actually called like the timeout. It's a pretty tense time and I'm passing out water bottles and Jake Weiss decides to have a little fun and liven things up and squirts me and you guys can figure out the rest of where that went. And everybody starts kind of laughing a little bit. And I can't remember who the coach was in the huddle at the time. I, I think it was Jeff Marty and Coach Everett, I think. And even they were giggling a little bit about it. And everybody just kind of calmed down. And, and that was before the biggest play they come up to the line and they audible. They audible black two, black two twenty two. Um, when this happened, every single person on their line like looked like looked at me, right? Like stared right at me, and I'm like, Jake, I think it's coming here. And we knew it was a dive to the two hole, and he stepped right up in that hole. and shut it down immediately. It's one of the most exciting football games I've been associated with as a, as a football coach. After the Dilworth game, they they played the game in school on the TVs. Every classroom had a TV, and they played the game on every TV in every classroom. So they just showed it the whole day at school the next day, and then the town really started to come out. And I think uh, being a basketball town, I don't think anybody knew how the playoffs worked. I had no idea how the playoffs worked. Evidently, a state playoff game gets played in your hometown, or the, or another. You know, it's either down south or up north, I don't know how it works, but that was where the town really started showing up because by then, Pelican Rapids was freezing and the town still came out and packed that field and I have cars all up along the field. That was, that was great to see. The ground, when you, when you tackle somebody or you got hit on it or anything, it was like rock hard. I remember at some point during the game, just kind of looking around and, and being amazed at all the people that were there, uh, whether it be cars up on the, on the far side, lining the fence line, stands packed, people standing everywhere on, on both sides of the field. So uh, a great atmosphere to be a part of and, and to get to play in that. And we knew that they had a good quarterback and they, they had, were gonna throw more than they ran actually, which was pretty much the first time we faced that during the whole season. And, and that's where I say, um, without having a good defensive backs, um, I'm sure they played a lot of teams where they that didn't have great corners or great athletes at corner and they just shredded them. But we had guys that could stand up to that pressure. You know, so they were passing a lot and I know our defensive ends, Fagan and Morrison had him running all over the place, and he making them throw some, make some tough throws. Um, but our defensive backs did a really good job. I mean, they still, they couldn't stop our run. We scored at will almost in that game. But we struggled a little bit to stop their pass, but we had just enough athletes and just a good enough defense to kind of keep them at bay. We ended up almost doubling them up in the score, even though I think it was right around 100 total points scored in that game, which was 
pretty phenomenal, but we scored over 60 of them. So we'll take that for a first round state game. After the game, I was sitting there on the field and we were like talking to like, you know, Dave's doing his speech. And I look up and my mom's there. I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, she's down there on the field with like other people like listening to the speech and I'm like, oh. As a team, we got together at midfield after every game and you talk through a couple things and it's just kind of routine and you know, get to tell the guys that we'll probably be practicing indoors because our next game is going to be indoors, but then looking up and it's like the whole town of Pelican Rapids was on our field with us after the game and uh, so the things that are most routine to us as coaches and players becomes an event uh, as people build in the excitement of, of the success and what's taking place. State semifinal game against Badger Greenbush Middle River. I, I think is a game that that we should look at with a chance to highlight Coach Marty and, and the defensive side of the football. I remember just repetition after repetition after repetition of drilling into our guys defensively what to expect and what to expect and uh, time after time after time and here's how we're going to play it, here's what we're going to do and being able to see it play out so effectively on, on game day was real exciting. The Badger game, they were in a lot of ways bigger and they were very, very physical. A couple things that stick out in my mind are that we game planned outside dives and that my main job was, I mean, to try to get an outside dive through the six hole or even wider. Everett kept saying wider, 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 wider. He, I'm not sure I've ever seen a coach that was as good at in-game adjustments as he was. You know, he saw how they, he knew, depending on what they did to cover our option, all the different aspects of our option, what to do. Well, I saw it right away. Their quarter, their defensive end ran for Moats, and the other guy ran for Schustrom, because they said, those guys are not catching a ball on a pitch. Well, the minute that happens, I, I knew that our ends didn't have to release, so to speak. You could double team that, or if the tackle played in the gap, you just took him. If he didn't play in the gap, you double teamed him. And Weiss was just running wild. Outside beer, way out there. And I was worried that, that Sober could have trouble getting the ball to him because there was not very t many times we could run what was called 36 dive. That means it was really wide. And so if we got Weiss on that wide, wide dive, that we were going to be good. Um, but the trouble is, it would, I had to sprint, barely get there. Like, usually you're handing off and riding it with two hands. I'm like, reaching out as far as I could. I could barely get there because Weiss was hitting the hole so hard, barely getting to his belly. But as soon as he hit the hole, he was by the guys. Um, they were big and strong and physical, but they weren't as fast as us. And, uh, but he got it there. And then a couple times he just faked it. They went for Weiss, the other guys running for Moats, and Solberg, he just walked in the end zone untouched. I mean, he got 95 yards. And they, they were a tough team. They were really tough to run on, and they could not handle Jake Weiss. They just couldn't get that guy to the ground. And that that's where having, you know, a lot of guys on offense really helped because they were stopping Moats pretty well, it seemed like, and Weiss just ran wild. And, He's, he really led us to victory in that one. O offense and defense, because that was a physical game. The way they just ran the ball was very physical, and that's where you need a, a, you know that big middle linebacker in there, and that's what Weiss was. And that was a fun game. I really liked that one. I, there was one play, they pitched it to the outside, and uh, it, was, it was Dylan like chasing him. So the guy couldn't cut back, so I had an angle. And if he would have cut back, he'd have got tackled, so I knew we had to meet. And we collided. It was, the biggest collision all year, and that was awesome. Was, I love that stuff. When, when you know he can't come back, and it's like, here we go. Let's do it. One other little thing I remember, too, is we um, did a little play action, uh, dive pass. So I, I rode it, and then I just stepped one back, and um, Fear ran a corner to the corner of the end zone and made a really awesome catch. And I felt bad for him, too, because they called him down, I think, right at the one-yard line. But that was a 
it was good to come out of that one. Um, and then obviously we we're off to the state championship after that, which doesn't get any better than that. Being able to rest starters at the end of the game and turn it over to backups and for them to have an experience to play in that situation was exciting for everybody and thinking it's not supposed to be this easy. Um, but that's, that's how good we were at that point. And uh, again, kind of maybe that unfinished business, we took care of the business for that day and allowed us to move on to the next week. Waterville Legion Morristown, we left for the game. We went up and down Main Street in the bus. That was pretty cool. We took down the windows on the bus. Everybody's out there cheering. Uh, we got to go stay in the hotel. That was pretty great. And then uh, I remember the game. It was an earlier game, like the 1 o'clock. So they get us out on the field. We're going to return the kickoff. And they just make us wait until I get a commercial or something. And Moats is over there. And Moats is the least fired up guy ever. And he is getting more and more fired up. We're back there for this kickoff. And I remember him just getting revved up. And I was thinking, the water will even more sound is in trouble. They don't even know it. This, the wrong guy is fired up for this game. First half was amazing, right? I mean, we were just smoking them. All cylinders are going. Realistically, I thought it was over at halftime. It was 34 to 20. We started a little bit slow, but we made, like, Terry Motes had three carries for 150 yards. Ryan Schuster returned to kickoff for a touchdown. Uh, we ran a screen pass to Motes, I think, scored. Like, Soberg scored. Like, we just made every offensive play possible. I felt like it was like the prior two games in the state tournament because nobody could stop our offense. You know, we, we made some big plays in that game, uh, picked up some, uh, some quick touchdowns, which really dictated how Waterville was going to approach the second half. I've had some, some good visits with, with John Bach and with their coach several times since that, that night in that game. And, uh, they came back with the onside kicks. They just decided, and it was. It, I think it's great. They that was a great coaching decision. We're just not going to kick them the ball. If we score, we're just going to onside kick. Third quarter, whatever, and they did, and it worked. We probably had literally eight or ten snaps the whole second half, and yet it come down to us making plays on defense. I mean, it's crazy to think that we played defense for 22 and a half minutes in the second half. Right, scored 34 points in the first first half. Didn't get the ball back in the second half. It's like an amazing, like that just bodes well for how good our defense was. You know, guys made plays. We made enough plays to win the game. Um, but how many teams in the state do you think are going to only allow what do we allow? 12 points in 23 and a half minutes of offense in one half, like once you think that you, you, you'd give up more. It's crazy. I might be wrong on this, but I think I was only in on offense for maybe like a minute and 30 seconds, it felt like, in the whole second half. It was dreadful for me to watch that second half where, where they were getting momentum and everything. But, but you know what, it's like, it's what I, our defense did what a good defense does. They, even though they, uh, they, we bended a little bit because they're a good team. We definitely didn't break, and we made plays when we needed to make plays. You know, like um, Moats's play in the end zone as a D back, phenomenal. We stopped the two point conversions. It's a way that we were able to get to the point where they're throwing a touchdown to try to win the game. I'll never forget this. You know, I felt like our nerves were kind of high at that point. Like, come on, boys, we have to stop them here. And I just remember Jake uh, Weiss in the in the huddle right before that play, big smile on his face, and he was just taking it in. And he just he just uh, he said something like, "Boys, this is what it's all about." And it was almost like, just for me personally, almost like a reset. Right, yeah, they have to get in the end zone and uh, at the most they can use two plays. So uh, getting a first down is, is not even in the cards. And you have to get out of bounds if you don't get in. 
Hackett rolling out. He's going straight back. Throws it up. Intercepted. Then I hear cheering, and I look over, and I see Mr. Helgen's feet probably this high off the ground. And that's when I knew that something happened. We intercepted it or something, and I didn't know that it was until we watched it. Or, you know, seconds later, that it was Matt Field that intercepted it. But, to ice the game. Make sure if a ball is thrown down the middle that you cause some diversion. Leo, the way this game started turnover-wise is how it's going to end. Matt Fear made the pick just like in the first quarter. My, you know, my uncle lifts my dad over uh, in, his, in his wheelchair, and then I, you know, take a picture of my mom and dad on the field, and um, you know, we're get. To do that, you know, you're celebrating with your teammates, and it's it's amazing because you put in like, all this hard work over the years, and it's it's so crazy to see it come true because it's hard to really kind of to fathom. To be 16, 17, 18 years old and to win that state championship together and the excitement and the way the town rallied around us um, is something very memorable that, that I know I'll never forget and I know everybody on that team will never forget. Okay. What a fantastic game it was. It started out as a shootout. In the second half, it was all time of possession by the Buccaneers. The Vikings defense on the field virtually the entire 24 minutes, but they made the stops with two interceptions late to hang on. And they are the 2A champions, winning 34-32. Coach David Hagen in his first year winning a state title. He had just done the thing that wasn't supposed to happen in Pelican Rapids. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, it was uh, pride. I think pride would be the biggest word for me. That's, and that's what it boils down to in the end. I mean, it's something we can be proud of. When you're talking to your buddies or you, know, you meet new people and you just talk about the old days, I'm just really proud of it. I'm really proud that we did it. And it's not something many people can say they've done. Uh, I was listening to a podcast today with a couple of NFL guys and uh, it was Brian Erlacher that brought up that he won state in high school and they talked about it for 10 minutes it, You know, he's like that's actually one of the things I'm most proud of you know off of everything we did in the NFL I, I'm really proud that we won state and I did it with a bunch of guys that I knew my whole life and I, that's how I felt I was listening to it thinking like yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah It was it. It was a great time in our lives What I'm doing now. I'm a paraprofessional at the high school here in Pelican. I coach football. I mean that's where I think that season started me on this path to where I'm at in my life right now. Even now, different things come up and people say, well, wait a minute, tell me about that, or what was that like? And uh, you just get to relive the, the memories and, and how great it was to be a part of that. For us to, to meet that dream, to actually achieve that dream, with such humble beginnings, but keeping in mind all the hard work that it took us to get to that point is um, something
something that is, the pride in that is something that's very hard to explain. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll always be pr proud of each and every one of the players on that team. And because uh, we needed them all. And we were so unselfish and we worked so hard. We put, we set aside our egos. We didn't care where we came from. Nobody was in it for the limelight, for the personal selves. And same goes for the coaches. They really believed in us. And I don't think of a position that w that we had that was weak, that that could have been exploited. You know, it, it just everything on both sides of the ball seemed to be just solid. And and it's that is very rare, especially for you know a school our size to have that many talented and uh, skill. You know people with that, that level of skills. And then to have the coaching staff that can recognize that, you know, have those young men believe in themselves and put forth an effort every time, every week, you know, in every practice. So so that, that's, that to me was the biggest takeaway. It's just to have that, that much talent in one group is probably a once in a career, you know, I've, I'm getting towards the end of mine. I got, I got a ways to go, but, um, you know, I don't know if we'll, we'll see that level ever again.